Huxley. So there's this huge part of the spectrum that we wanted to step up and fill. And that's what we've done with our technology. We received a patent. Uh, let's see, it's going to be now uh, almost a, a year and a half, two years ago. And what's, it, it's a very simple approach. What's unique about the technology is we use the existing password. So we're not asking you to uh, remember or use something else. We are taking what you're probably already using and allow you to continue to use it, but just make it much stronger. So it's a, a simple process that allows you to come in and this is loading. I'm, I'm on the, the Wi-Fi here, which is a bit slow. But it, it, it's, a, it's a very simple process. You come in as usual, select your password, and in this case, John Smith selects grid one, the GRID and the number one. And the next step would be to choose a target corner. So in this case, John Smith with grid one chooses the upper right. That gets stored into the system. Now the next time John Smith comes in to authenticate, puts in John Smith, a grid is displayed, and as you can see, uh, values are sent to the grid. And I'll actually run through and just show you an actual login. But values are sent to the four corners of the grid. So instead of John Smith typing in grid one, he references the grid. The upper right of the G is a three, puts in a three. The uh, R is a four, puts in a four, and so on. So instead of typing grid one, John Smith is putting in 34814. The next time John comes in to authenticate, all new values are sent to the grid. As you can see in this little flash on the uh, screen here, and if we look at the upper right corner, you can see every time it changes, every call to authenticate, the numbers change. So again, it's just a really simple, clean way to use your existing password, but authenticate with a one-time password. And I think you'll see very quickly uh, I'm going to log into our Juniper SSL VPN, and I'm letting all of you basically shoulder surf or observe the authentication. And as you'll see very quickly, it's a, it's a very powerful tool. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a little num keypad on the side, go ahead and authenticate, and you'll see quickly that uh, it's very difficult for you to try to uh, reverse engineer or figure out what I'm doing. So if I pause here for a second, you can see that there's a five. Now, this is assuming that I'm just choosing uh, a one position. So if you look across the grid, there's multiple fives located throughout the grid. And the technology is really tunable. So you can choose to populate the UI as the implementer. You could say, you know, I have a lot of field agents. I'm worried about observation. So you could tune the character set. And you could say, look it, I want you to populate the uh, corners of the grid with only uh, six random characters. So what that does is it creates a lot more duplication. And there's a balance you know, uh, that you can achieve by tuning the grid. So I'll go ahead and authenticate in front of you. And I'm into my VPN. So you can see here, I, you know, I don't think there's many technologies that will let you have everything at the point of attack. And you still really have no idea what the underlying password is. And again, we could uh, let you screenshot it and take the information because as I uh, you know, talked about and showed some other folks. If I come back in here, I log in. You can see all new values are sent to the grid, but I, I could choose a password. So if we, uh, you know, take a quick look at um, a number here. Uh, so let's, let's just say I had a five in my password. I could have chose my pin, the password to be the upper right, add one to it. So if you see, the, the six was there, I would key in a seven. So if someone was attacking and they actually were able to do a concerted attack, get the grid and get the answer that I put in, you're talking about, on an eight character password, trillions of possible permutations that could exist. And we have you know, analysis, uh, third party independent analysis that did cryptography against you know, static password and what this system does to generate OTPs that I could uh, you know, share with any of you if you were interested. But that's, uh, that's the system. It's, uh, we're, we're making it very customizable. A uh, new iteration that we're showing at RSA will allow you to skin and upload photos uh, on the UI. Uh, if someone was here that they uh, you know, wanted to change it to Arabic uh, on the fly, they could uh, select Arabic. And as you'll see, the UI can instantly change over to uh, an Arabic character set. It's, uh, it's loading now. Uh, you could put Morse code, uh, music notes. 
here we go. You can see it's, ha it's just going slow down here because of the Wi-Fi. Sure, sure. Uh, you, you can see it jumped over to Arabic, and again, you, you get it. It could be Chinese, kanji, Cyrillic, really just any character set, uh, which, which, which is great because, you know, the two universal languages are mathematics and music, and this really uh, helps with localization that we have with existing customers. They can allow the UI, the same technology, to be used by different regions, different users, with it customized for their authentication. Uh, yeah, the... Uh, uh, the company has been around, uh, you know, two years. We uh, spent the first uh, several years before that making sure that we could protect the IP, uh, going through the patent process, uh, running independent searches, going through and making sure we could protect it because it's a pretty simple idea when you think about it. Uh, so we had spent the first few years doing a lot of IP, um, building out some prototypes, building out various, uh, uh, you know, laptop versions. You know, you can, we can drop this in and replace the Gina on the laptop. As you're seeing, we have a web-based remote access version. Uh, there's uh, right now 12 of us in the company. Uh, we've secured our first few big wins, which is great. We're going after verticals. Uh, we're privately funded. Uh, we have the ability to raise VC. We're, we're contemplating that now because some of these wins and uh, what we see is maybe support, testing, uh, diffusing anything about being a small company, having security as a, a critical technology. Uh, and bringing smart money to the table, we're, we're uh, you know, weighing that out. The angels that we have backing the company uh, you know, are, 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 are true angels, but they don't have software security uh, background. They don't have authentication uh, you know, expertise. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, pretty much it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Say that again, RSAs. Uh, well, I'm not sure they have the secure ID. They have a, a Go ID. They have, which, which is, is that the soft token? Uh, so you go into ID Direct. Okay. And then uh, it's basically your customer number. The second stage is just a picture of something selected in the ID Site key. Where you have. Oh, Site key. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's Site key. Okay. Yeah, they're, um, we're exploring licensing opportunities with them right now. Um, we have a patent on this, and uh, they're now exploring licensing. Theirs is a one-to-one -one mapping. It's very easy to just observe. So if you look at our keypad, um, if you're used to the IMG account, I think this will resonate for you. So we've done the same thing with uh, uh, the technology. But what we've done is we've created a much stronger approach because, again, if I see you at, on the ING, um, you know, that the keypad, the, the, and I'm not sure if it's A uh, or, or listed on the keys and the one ab Correct. Correct. Okay. And then site key is mutual authentication. You guys are probably all familiar with that. But this does user authentication. You know, again, mutual authentication is great if you're on a machine, but if you still have a key logger there or if you're not at that machine, that's the hard part about it. They'll say, hey, we don't recognize this machine. Do you still want a bank? You say yes, and they ask you static knowledge base questions that, again, once compromised. I think last year at RSA, you guys know that someone had set the kiosks to uh, store the browser information, and people were actually logging into the kiosks and... Sure, sure. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. in the 
the way of their jobs is a downside. Now, if you look at what happens to a lot of security software, it turns into shelf life. And there are a number of reasons for that. And one of them is they're just too much trouble for the end user to use. Uh, if you look at, the, if, if you've got a security product and the user is not obliged to use it, the chances are that they won't unless using the secure product makes their job easier. And a lot of times it's the administration that is, all right, I've been in the MSS business, I've had people go out on site and say, you'll never believe this, quarter million dollar firewall, it's just passed through. And I'll say, yes, I'll believe that. We had one last week as well. And so what I'm thinking about, oh, the other problem with a lot of startups is a lot of security products are built around a business model, not a customer need. So they work out how they're going to make the money from the product first, and then they work out the product around it. Now, the way that I think that we need to be going is we make job number one making the user's job easier to do and then they might actually use the product but before that what we got to do is to look at the you know we had that tale of woe and depression this morning to at the kickoff don't sell security products today sell products that make network administrators and computer administrators jobs easier that happen to use security technology as part of that process. And that's part of what I'm trying to do here. One of the things that makes it easier to administer the network is if you know for sure what the programs that are out there, what the devices that are out there, then instead of having a human administrate administer them, you can have the network administer them. Because you can authenticate the commands going out, you can authenticate the communications coming in. And what that allows us to get to is a security posture I call default deny. And the idea is, in default deny network, nothing happens without a reason for it happening. So you take this laptop, you plug it into the Ethernet port, nothing happens unless there's a policy that says this is allowed to connect. I take the coffee maker, plug it in, nothing happens unless you know, it says, OK, I'm a coffee pot. Here's my MAC address. I need the NTP service. I need the I make coffee service. And it gets those and nothing else. So the idea is a very tight lockdown on security, but that tight lockdown is enabled by the information and the authentication that's provided by the, authentic the, uh, the support technology. So it's a bit complicated to describe it in one go. I describe how to do it in more detail in there and I'll spend some more time over the next few years making it a product. Uh, so, uh, just out of curiosity, are, are, you, are you placing emphasis on, on uh, make sure I hear this right, on a, on a role-based set of security protocols and controls, and how does that relate to um, constrictive controls versus this? Facilitating controls, if that, if that makes sense. What, what I hear you talking about is uh, uh, security wrapped around roles within the business. But I, I also heard you say that, that folks are worried about business models they approach versus the, what the customers really want. Well, uh, my, from my experience there, they should be one in the, in the same. But I, I'm hearing a lot of talk about uh, roles in a business, building a security model to, to help that scenario. But now you're talking about the, the, the user satisfaction, which in a business, in a, in a typical business environment, the users being happy versus the roles of the business are, are two separate things and the controls yeah. are, are built entirely different uh, manners. Well, one of the things that comes up is why, why does the IT department have to grab so much control from the user? And that is when you put a machine on your, you know, if I put this, if you put a laptop onto a network, it's got a processor here, it will run software that's downloaded from the internet that comes in on CD-ROM. That is a pretty powerful machine, and that is always going to be a serious source of vulnerability. And so there's a certain amount of risk that you apply. Now, today, when you plug in a printer, the only two things legitimately that that printer could do is to 
receive an instruction to print and to send out a plea to say, help, help give me more paper or toner or whatever. So, so and those are the only two things a device could do. But today, when you pl plug that printer into your network, you've got, you've got to allow it to send sin floods onto your network to snoop on the network, to look at all the traffic, to denial of service you, to be a telnet, to be a relay for any malware or whatever. And so because your security policy is all or nothing, I allow this thing inside my security perimeter and once I've made that decision, I've got to give it the crown jewels. And what I think is that if we reduce that so that when you plug, you know, you give the, the employee a laptop, and if by default, all that employee could do with that laptop is email and web and nothing else, well, that's kind of controlled what happens if they do get infected by malware. So, so, you, so you are essentially talking about a, a roles-based uh, set of, of, of policies, but the, 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 the problem that I see there, and I, I have, uh, unfortunately, a, a a really awkward view of this. Uh, I, 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 work at, I work at Microsoft, so I deal with a large population of, of um, individuals in different roles in business, and, and the business is granted everyone in these roles a certain uh, uh, tasks that they're supposed to perform in order to help the business uh, um, uh, succeed. Uh, so the, the, the build, build, thinking about building the security model around that uh, when you, when you go down that rabbit hole far enough, the first thing you realize is that you're not really dealing with a security problem first. You're, you're dealing with an identity, uh, I identity management problem at a basic layer. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily uh, a security woe that, that your, your printers are actually executing code that doesn't involve spitting out uh, uh, you know, pie charts. It's that you haven't been able to identify all the appropriate rules inside the business and wrap them around your basic operations we're talking about security uh, uh, management from, from a business perspective uh, and, uh, and certainly from a pure okay. so, uh, if security you, what, pillar. Right. You, you've gone from a, yeah, there's an easy problem here, which is how do I limit the amount of exposure to my coffee pot, my printer? <coughs> I mean, in any network in the future, the number of humans are going to be a small percentage of the number of actors in that network and the number of laptops and desktops will be a small number proportion of the number of computers. Exactly. So, you know, if we take, if we take, if, if we just let the humans have absolute, con you know, no controls on them whatsoever, we can still get leverage by tightening up the security on the devices. But the second piece is, access control by itself is very weak, because all you can do with access control is to set the low watermark for security. If you try and set the bar too high with access control, then what happens is that people can't do their jobs and nothing can happen. So what you need to do is how do you, you know, you've got the low bar, how do you set a high bar? Well, that's where you've got to use accountability. You cannot write in advance the list of things that people are permitted to do. All that you can, it, for most things, what you have to do is you give them a certain amount of privilege, you look and see what they do about it, and then you hold them accountable. And that's actually the, the major premise of the book is accountability and accountability-based security. And you know, I was instrumental in bringing that into the spam filtering world. When I first went to the MIT spam conference, and everybody was talking about Bayesian filtering. And I was saying, no, think about it in terms of access control and accountability. I was laughed at then. Today, how do we do authentication, how do we do email spam control? Well, domain, contr domain keys, identified mail, and SPF are where it's all at. It's how, <laughs> it is, if you are, were at Yahoo or G Google, yeah, <coughs> it means that they're no longer spending 90% of their computing resources filtering mail that the others have sent, they're sending to each other. That is what they were doing beforehand.
Is this on? Oh, is this just for the? Uh, all right. So I'll put it low and I'll project. Okay. All right. My name is Rob Sheen. A lot of you know in the room know me. Some of you don't. Um, I'm here with my business partner Paul Hinkle, and I'm the CEO and founder. And he's one of my co founders He's you know number two, and Mike is off I think selling something. So um, the three of us are the founders of the company, and we are an information security education company. So our specific mission is to tr help train employees on security. So I'm going to try to. Um, to really make this about our business model and not just pitching our stuff. Because I, I think I know that there's some people in there that really want to start things. And I think um, kind of seeing what we did over the last 18 months, it may be helpful. So I'm going to try to focus on that. Um, by all means, ask me lots of questions about what we've done. I, I like to share. So um, this is just kind of our pitch, how we pitch the market. You know, software development's complex. Fixing buggy code is very expensive. We very frequently throw up the IBM graph that says if you have a $1 bug in in, that you find in design, that same bug's you know, exponentially more expensive the further you wait all the way until production and it's you know, 60x or something. Um, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. So. And then we, we kind of equate it to you know, how effective is the drug war been? You know, it's stopping the flow of bad things into your organization is like stopping the flow of you know, cocaine into the country. It just doesn't work. So we see the problem is really a problem of education. You know, the, the, um, the genesis of this company was I get sick of going to RSA every year and seeing another vendor selling another authentication module, another smart car. No offense if there's anybody in the room doing that or anything like that. But there, we have enough damn products, guys. We need people in process. People in process is the real issue. We have lots of technology. How are we going to apply it? Why are you guys laughing at me? <laughs> Sorry. Probably your solution is stop going to RSA. My solution, well, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there is the, the W after the, the show, and that's a kind of fun. So, uh, so our pitch is basically, um, you know, we enable the organization to practically manage secu information security risk. And we really do that by building information security education programs. So we're not just going to be you know, pitching a course, but we're trying to actually help institute an awareness program across not just developers, but other folks as well. Um, developers love training, right? <laughs> That's kind of our challenge. We're always in this environment where I show up and I have to, in the first five minutes, win them over, or I've lost them for an entire day or possibly two or three days. And that's an interesting challenge, because how do you deal with the fact that you know, people show up to the class and they're like, mm, I don't want to be here. You know? So Paul and I are kind of the last guard from the old At Stake days, from the At Stake Academy. And at this point, we've been teaching information security for five years. And I think we've, we've been doing it longer than most. And we had a lot of experience teaching to different types of environments, different types of employees. You know, I've literally shown up and had the guy in the back of the room with his feet up on the desk reading the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, you have to reach that guy. <laughs> um, one other thing, I mean, over time, we've kind of worked out some interesting formulas for this. And I think that's one of the things that we've found that's our niche that allows us to be successful in this space, is that, you know, we're able to go into a room and pretty quickly command the audience and say, you know, here's why it's important. You know, we'll spend the first half of the the first day, just scaring the hell out of them, just because if you don't do that, they are not going to respect what you have to say. If you just say, thou shalt do this, and this is just anybody that wants to communicate security, thou shalt doesn't work. They're like, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. They put up this big wall between you and them. Um, we've also been trying to recently innovate in this space for instructor-led training. We actually offer instructor-led training and e-learning. And e-learning is a fairly new thing, but from our business model point of view, it's not. You know, we went into the company starting this thing knowing that I've done the services thing. I saw the at stake model. I saw that services doesn't scale so good. You know, if, you have a, if you're trying to build a services company, you have to scale, you know, one extra unit of revenue is one extra headcount. And it always kind of works that way, more or less. And, um, and then obviously you have the turnover problem where every two years you lose an employee that has a lot of mind share. And how do you deal with that? 
So we went into this knowing that ultimately training is going to become commoditized. It, it is on some level already, but for what we do, it's kind of, we've been kind of shielded from that a little bit. And, but as we, as we start to shift into e-learning, where that's, that's where it's going, whether we like it or not, so we've decided that we're going to be at the forefront of that, and we're trying to really innovate in the space. And uh, when we started building our e-learning, the things that were out there that we saw, I don't know if I haven't probably looked at everything, but mostly it was PowerPoint slides with voiceovers. And you watch it for two minutes, and you just start drooling on yourself. It's just painful. So we, tried to, uh, we set out specifically with the goal of making it fun, making it interesting and not painful, and trying to, as best as possible, replicate what we do in the classroom on the computer. And you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of um, managing that. Oops. So th this is kind of, these are some of our courses that we have to offer. Again, this, I'm not here to pitch anything other than just here's what we have to offer. Um, again, we started out just, we essentially had a fundamentals course and a, secure, a generic language agnostic secure coding course. But from the beginning, and this is just w one of those interesting things as you're, as you're starting a company, you know, map out where you want to be in two years, five years. You know, the first thing I did was I sat down at one of the RSA conferences with their notebook, opened it up, and I started mapping out what's the mission, what's the vision. And I actually, this is an interesting exercise to do. I said, if I wanted to, you know, because at this point, you know, starting a company is scary as hell when you haven't done it before from scratch. And I'm looking at, like, literally walking off the, the precipice into nothing. And I'm like, well, if I just wanted to make $100,000 a year, you know, how, what would that look like? What would $250,000 a year? What would $500,000 a year look like? And I actually mapped it out in the notebook all the way up to $25 million just to see what it looked like. Just one page per, per item, just for fun. And it was just, just to start to craft what the vision would need to be in order to get there. And I think a lot of people that I see and talk to that do startups don't do that. They don't take the time to design what they want to build first. They just start go, 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 go. And then the next thing they do, well, I don't know what to do about this economy thing. I didn't plan for that. Right? So we've tried to really address those things up front by designing it that way from the beginning. Uh, this is just a screenshot of our e-learning. Uh, if we have a few minutes, I might show you 10 seconds of it just um, to give you an idea of what we're doing. If you want a full demo, we're going to be here the rest of the week. Please ask Mike for a demo. He'll, um, he'll be more than happy to give you one. Um, this is a, we actually did this slide probably about a year ago, so it's probably a little bit out of date. But essentially what I want to show is just we went into this knowing, you know, our existing clients were already in financial services, so that's a, that's a no-brainer. Um, but we kind of went through the obvious people that are going to need security first and take it seriously first, right? Because, you know, if I, you don't want to sit and waste a lot of time trying to sell to people that aren't buying. So we, we looked at who's buying and kind of went in that route. I mean, the way I look at it is every single person on the planet that uses computers needs to know about security because I don't see how we're going to make the problem any better anytime soon otherwise. I really do think that it has to be everybody's job and everybody needs to play a part. So the vision for the company is, you know, we started with developer training because that's what we were good at and knew how to do already. So we've been bootstrapping with that, right? So bootstrap with what you're already good at, especially if it's a service. That's, you know, a great way to get the cash flowing in. You know, we made a goal when we started the company. It was June 2007. And we said, all right, you know, we're going to each have to put in some money and not take salaries for six months, which I got to say was a little nerve wracking. And we each decided, we each had, you know, started taking from our own various ways of funding it for, but we were basically paying our own salaries for six months. And six months today, I'm proud to say that we all got paychecks. And that was kind of cool. And we did that by bootstrapping with what we already knew. But then, you know, from the beginning though, as we were doing that, whenever we had downtime, we started filling in our curriculum that we'd already mapped out and started building and building and building. And then, you know, pretty quickly, we've expanded out what we have to offer. Uh, this is kind of just a quick timeline. We've obviously obfuscated all the company names. Um, we had the advantage of coming in. You know, as soon as we left our former employer, some of our clients called us and said, um, your former employer kind of screwed this up, so make it better. Um, so we kind of leveraged that, and we've kind of been going ever since. Uh, this just shows, I'm not going to go into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. Ask any questions? We're based uh, three states. We're out of Bos uh, Boston, Rhode Island, and New York. So that's a really good question. Um, so, do you want? To, yeah, yeah. Do you go on? Shut me up. Yeah, it's not at all unusual for us to be, essentially be the mouthpiece of the business organization saying, you know, here's what needs to happen and why it's important. So. And also the mouthpiece of the developers. Yes, going both, yeah, we help bridge that both ways. Other questions? Any questions? No?
Right. We definitely didn't want it. We tried to avoid VCs like the plague because we didn't want to give up 80% of our company for nothing. So. And you worked at Outstake at one time. And I worked at Outstake at one time. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's the, well, it, it depends on what you're on your model. Um, you know, there are some models that kind of require VC funding. If you're going to go out and build an infrastructure product, it requires, you know, building a lot of hardware and stuff. You know, it, there's no two ways around it. You have to build some inventory and, you know. But if you're doing something that's software based, if you can bootstrap it, do it for as long as you can before you go to the big guys. And, you know, beg, plead, steal, whatever you need to do to get it funded and keep the cash flows in the early days. And I, I really um, can't recommend enough, get your paperwork in order correctly. Don't screw around, pay the money for the lawyers, get your paperwork and your, all your legal di um, documents in place. It'll bite you otherwise later if you don't. So just do it right from the beginning as best you can. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Right. Or a publishing company. Right, that's a really good question. So ultimately, what we're trying to be is more like Disney, right? Because one of the things that I see as a big issue, and we all see as a big issue, is that you know, security folks don't tend to talk like business folks and vice versa. And we, we're pretty good at bridging that gap. That's something we're good at. So we're leveraging the fact that we're good at that to be that Mid that translation layer, so to speak, and you know we really see ourselves as a content company like Disney, ultimately. And, and so we use Flash instead of people's faces. We use voiceover artists right. instead of doing the recordings ourselves. Those weren't conscious decisions to minimize our personal exposure in terms of recognizability, but they definitely um, were part of the vision of creating content that stands on its own instead of you know building up all the brands. Yeah, this was not supposed to be the, the Rob and Paul show. <laughs> so, any other questions? All right, who's next? Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, well, Rocky, just Stefano with Decurity. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about the people in Decurity, and then I'll just talk about our business model. And then if you're interested, I'll tell you what we do. Um, Paul Davis and I are, are the exact at Decurity. Paul Davis is running around here somewhere. Um, his background is he ran global information security services for Unisys. 
He was also um, with me at EDS, where he acted as the CSO for a couple of Fortune 50 organizations. So he's got a really good background at a high level. Uh, my background is, is much more humble, I guess. Um, I started in the Air Force as an intelligence analyst, came out of there and worked at AFCERT as an incident response member of AFCERT. And I worked with people like Rich Baitlick, who's, of course, running incident response for GE, who I'm good friends with. And, uh, you know, folks like uh, Chad Renfro, who runs information security for Bank of America now. And I felt like, you know, I was left behind here. These guys went out and did all these awesome things. But I had some good opportunities. I went out of AFCERT and created two MSSPs, one for a startup company, uh, the other one for EDS. I ran EDS's MSSP out of Virginia uh, for their federal and Fortune 50 clients. Out of that organization, though, I was looking for ways to automate and become more efficient. And I really ran into SIM and saw a lot of value in SIM. So out of EDS's MSSP, I actually jumped on board with ArcSight and was there for four and a half years or so. And in that time, I went through the consulting ranks and, and basically managed the consulting team for ArcSight for a number of years. And out of ArcSight, I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, <laughs> ArcSight's awesome. Log management, these tools are awesome. Uh, Sim is really powerful. But we're not building a lasting relationship with the client. And in order to be successful with these clients, we have to build a lasting relationship because their needs are changing and we have to adapt. So I started my own company and just really started as consulting, building security operations centers, because that's pretty much what I had a background in with the MSSPs. And I got very, very lucky. And I'll reiterate that over and over again. I have been extraordinarily lucky with the clients I have. Out of the gate, my first clients, Best Buy and the US Department of Justice, GE, Northrop Grumman, building their security operations centers from top to bottom. Um, I couldn't ask for a better proving ground. Uh, and better relationships and better ways uh, really to build my business. They asked me, we need more. Uh, there's only one of you that's great, but you can't scale, you can't support us all. I was killing myself, killing my family. So I called Paul and said, Paul, all right, let's, let's think about a better way to do this. And uh, about a year ago, he joined me, and we started thinking of ways that we could scale beyond just a consulting company. So the idea we came up with was, all right, let's make these services more of a subscription service. Let's bring the, the expertise in-house and do as much of this WebEx as we can and go on site once a month, really build partnerships with these clients, wherever, once a month, once a week, whatever it took. Build relationships with these clients, understand what they're doing, maintain the stuff that we should have done back at some of these other companies, which was a customer profile. Understand what they're doing, where they're headed. Keep that stuff. Keep the content that we're building around their solutions. Bring that in-house and share these solutions between the clients. Really, I mean, simple, scalable stuff. What we found is the clients are saying, that's awesome. <laughs> Build it, make it bigger. Show me how to really make log management and SIM work. So we're, we're very niche. Log management and SIM is really where we, within a security operations framework. I'm not even at the point now with the company that I want to focus on compliance. Because honestly, I think people that buy these products directly for compliance are fighting a losing battle to start with. I want to focus on security, and, and my company can do that. Um, we've been lucky with that. So, you know, we started this thing totally bootstrapped, no, no investment whatsoever with a consulting organization. That was easy, right? I mean, that's pretty brain dead simple. Now that we're growing and becoming more of a subscription based provider, um, you know, we look at the money and look at it and say, okay, maybe we should look at listening for money, or maybe we should look at the people that are talked about acquiring us to see if we can scale. We know we have something. We know it has a limited scope, but we know we're laser focused on that scope. And we know our competition because I trained most of them uh, in previous lives, and we know them very, very well. We partner with our competition in a lot of cases. And in some cases, our, our competition is really the vendor themselves who sub work to us. It's a very strange little market we've, we've wove ourselves into. Um, but when it comes to log management and SIM, more and more companies are coming to us. We're, you know, we're this little tiny place, and they're saying, help us find the right tools for us. Once we get them in place, help us manage them. Help us rebuild this content and make it work within our organization. And we initially sat out and said, okay, great. You know, this is a one week or one month relationship. 
every single one of our relationships is minimum of a year long. Uh, it's not short term. So th that's the really thing we focus on is true partnerships with these clients. I don't want 10,000 clients. I would be thrilled with 100 fascinating clients that we can really scale and partner and grow and make, be that trusted partner in SIM and log management, incident response, security operations, and grow within that. That's kind of who we are, where we start, and where we're going. Simple enough. Questions? No questions. So, <laughs> so um, let me say this carefully. I, I, <laughs> let me be careful. I, so I like ArcSight. Um, I really, really do. They, they do wonderful things. They did a hell of a quarter last quarter. I mean, there are lots of, lots of good stuff there. I wanted to focus on customer service first and foremost. Um, they wanted to focus on billable utilization. Um, it's fine. I felt that as a software company, they should really focus on building services to support software. They said, no, we need to be profitable in both areas. I said, okay, I'm going to go start my own and be customer or service oriented, um, however I can be. That's the way ArcSight started, and that's really what got me into there was they were very customer service oriented. But as they had a new management, it changed. I mean, <laughs> Rafi can attest. Things changed. Uh, it went much towards, too much towards profit, not enough about the customer. I had to make that change for me. So how is it going to continue for you? Are you, you said you're in service right now, you're probably going to grow with customers, yeah. head office, you acquired it. I heard that out of what you said. Yeah. Um, how's it going to go? At this point, we're dedicated to, to staying independent and making this work because I want to support more than just ArcSight and more than just one product. And if we got acquired, a lot of those companies are saying, hey, just come do this for us. So you know, broadening in terms of products. That products, you yeah, support. exactly. So you know, out of the gate, ArcSight was the first one we supported, obviously. A lot of my staff came from ArcSight. One came from Splunk. So we have a lot of product expertise in those specific areas. Um, but there are other companies we're partnering with to learn and become that deep in those specific products. At this point, our focus is in, within security operations and as they use SIM and log management within those. So I'm not necessarily looking at uh, network operations and things. Those are certainly areas I can go into. But at this point, we're, we're focused on security operations and how they use log management and SIM within that framework. So you're basically happy with what you have? And you I'm slowly. thrilled with what I have. I'm thrilled that we're still here through this market, that our, companies are st our customers are still spending money with us increasing investment with us, and uh, we're looking at, and, and people are calling us at this point. We don't have a dedicated sales team. You know, our real market presence is between our blog and Twitter are, are the two key tools we'll use to go out there and tell people, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, and we have the level of client we have, which is Fortune 100 and U.S. government. I think if you can 
build a model that truly scales, whether or not you want to own that many customers. Right. Uh, I think you have something that you can replicate elsewhere uh, in other businesses, in other forms, based on your IP. Uh, something you should definitely not underestimate. But it's, it's awesome that you're still I appreciate that. I really do. I mean, we don't ever want to take ourselves too seriously. We're having fun with this. Um, we do recognize there's value there. Obviously, we started the company or let the company evolve to the point where it is, but it really has evolved. I wish I could stand up and say, yeah, I had this whole vision and it just it worked out this way and it was, no, oh, I got lucky. And, and, and not only, we worked my ass off, don't get me wrong. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we put in a lot of hours every day to make these customers happy, but it's worth it because I can do what we need to do to make them happy. And we're making these software companies successful. They're seeing renewals in their software because customers are actually using it and extending value out of it. I mean, so it's, there's a good relationship there with the vendors we work with. Except for you. <laughs> sure. Other questions? Go. I promise to not talk about technology or products at all. I'll talk about what we've been doing for the past three years. We'll be three years old next month. Um, we've been mostly self-funded. This is a team that's worked together for the past 20 some odd years. This is my fourth startup. We've literally made probably seven billion dollars for previous VC investors. All three startups were successful. Um, we've done acquisitions. They've either had IPOs or acquisitions. And we came up with this idea about three years ago. Um, I always like to do things that nobody's ever done before. So it's naturally one of my crazy ideas. We were lucky enough to get uh, what I might call seed funding. It was actually a research contract from the Maryland Program Office. And it allowed us to build a proof of concept in software and to uh, finish the architecture. It also allowed us to take advantage of some intellectual property that they own in combination with IBM. IBM actually builds the intellectual property that they have ownership rights of. So they walked us in the front door of IBM and said, why don't you use this technology? And we said, we'd love to. It's perfect for what we're doing. Um, IBM then enlisted uh, ISS to do nine months of due diligence on whether or not we were crackpots or not. Um, after we passed their nine month due diligence process, we signed a joint development agreement with them. Our, net, our space is we're looking to deploy security and carrier-based networks. Um, that's our expertise. And uh, we talked to 14 carriers as references. We uh, have a lead VC who spent nine months doing what I call gold standard due diligence. He was on every single customer call. We've met with Ed Amoros of AT&T and Verizon Business, Wag Leitner, and all those people. So, Everybody wants what we're doing, but the barrier to entry is significant, so raising money in this economy is non-trivial. Um, we think we're at a point where literally on March 30th, we'll, uh, this lead investor will have a partners meeting and hopefully the pen, which has been in his hand over the checkbook for much too long, will finally touch and we'll see some ink and uh, things will happen. So that's about it. Now you can go to the bar. I know I'm waiting. <laughs> what is it that you do? I can't tell you. Security and carrier network, something that's never been done before, in a way that's never been done before. Which part of the carrier networks? Layer two, layer three, four, eight? All of the above, at 100 gigabit speeds. Are you stuff for marketers? <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> you're, not, you're not worried about the changing landscape and, and the, uh, the potential, uh, I don't want to call it positive, but uh, corporations kind of taking, taking the carriers back to their own. I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, so, so uh, businesses moving their, their, their communication infrastructure back into their cores and, and leveraging their own pipes versus driving with the carriers along the way. Only the government has their own pipes, and even they get them from the carriers. Really? Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't want to start those off. We don't have those offices. But, but I, I don't really hear. <laughs> 
That's like saying we're going to put the internet back in the closet and not use it anymore. We don't see it at all. No, we, we talk about it with VCs, you know, but we're in stealth mode at this point. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Again, I, IBM is a corporate partner, and they're a reference. So, if a VC needs something more, and, and like I say, the VC that our, is our lead investor, you know, was at all of the customer meetings when we briefed the customers. The the carrier customers asked us all the hard questions. We gave them all the straightforward answers. But at, at this point, you know, it's not really public what we're doing. <laughs>